Uh, this is Dipto Sri. So I'm extremely happy to welcome you all uh, to seven uh, to our seventh webinar in Peak Studio webinar series. My heartiest welcome to Dr. Vivek uh, Raghunathan. He is a uh, co-founder and CTO of uh, Escape uh, Silicon Photonics Incorporation in the USA. So uh, he will uh, talk about uh, silicon photonics chiplets. Uh, before having this uh, exciting topic, I would like to request uh, Professor Vijay Krishna Das to introduce our respected speaker. Uh, I will also request uh, Dr. Sudarsanan Srinivasan to moderate our Q and a session. Over to Professor Das. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Sri. And uh, yeah, uh, good evening to you all. And uh, good morning to our honorable speaker, uh, Dr. Vivek Raghunathan. I think it is very early morning to him. Uh, we are really happy to get him. Uh, he, is, he is having a illustrious career uh, in the field of silicon photonics. And we are also proud to tell that uh, he is a, one of the uh, alumnus of our IIT Madras. Uh, he, got, he received his B.Tech degree here in IIT Madras. And then uh, he moved to uh, MIT, uh, where he received a doctorate degree in the area of silicon photonics. And uh, after a PhD, he is having about more than 14 years of experience, again, uh, in the integrated photonics, packaging, etc. And uh, in Intel particularly, he was working, uh, uh, he was leading next generation semiconductor packaging technology uh, for Intel's 14 nanometer and 10 nanometer technologies. And then he moved to Rathlev Photonics, where he led silicon photonics product integration for the uh, Datacom product line. And uh, finally, he moved to uh, Broadcom USA, where he was again leading, uh, he was a senior principal engineer and leading uh, uh, transceiver packaging uh, using silicon photonics and uh, demonstrated 25.6 terabit Ethernet switch co packaged with uh, silicon photonics chip layers. And that actually uh, uh, helped customers to save their 50% power saving. And uh, uh, very recently, and uh, he started uh, his own company, and he is actually co-founder, CTO uh, of that uh, startup. And the, uh, initially it was in the stealth mode. I hope uh, no more it is in the stealth mode. Uh, the company name is Escape Silicon Photonics Incorporation USA. And uh, he is also constantly our uh, inspiration uh, of silicon photonics research at IIT Madras, giving a lot of supports and uh, uh, advices. And uh, we are very proud of him. And we are very proud of him having as a speaker here. And uh, he will be uh, talking about uh, the silicon photonics packaging for next generation Datacom uh, applications. And we have in the panel, uh, 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 Professor Sudarsanan Srinivasan, who will be actually uh, moderating. And uh, I think uh, those who have registered, uh, you, you will be able to put up your question, and all this question uh, will be addressed uh, at the end of the talk. And also, this uh, webinar is uh, uh, live streaming through YouTube. There are uh, many people will be watching, I hope. Uh, all of you will be enjoying. And uh, with this note, uh, let's welcome uh, Dr. Vivek Raghunathan for his uh, exciting talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Vivek, over to you. Uh, thank you, Bijoy. Um, uh, let me share my screen. Are you able to see my slide? Yes. Again, uh, thanks, Professor Bijoy, for your kind introduction, and thank you, IIT Madras uh, faculty, for having me over. Uh, it's been um, uh, really uh, um, overwhelming to be back uh, giving a talk at IIT Madras, and um, I hope um, 
you're going to enjoy this talk on sustainable performance scaling with silicon photonics. So what do I mean by that? Um, I'm going to talk about how growth of AI is getting environmentally expensive and how co-packaged optics can actually help flatten that power curve of AI hardware. This is an image of an AMD server chip that is currently shipping in volumes to data centers for doing a lot of AI compute. And this is an image of Intel's data center transceivers that connects all these server chips together. Co-packaged optics is essentially bringing these two worlds together. Silicon photonics is one of the key building blocks for co-packaged optics, and I'm gonna discuss about how it actually does that. And finally, I'm gonna end this talk talking about what do we really need in order to realize the full potential of silicon photonics. This includes investments in other equally critical building blocks like packaging and test for this ecosystem. So let me start with um, talking about what really motivated me to get into the field of silicon photonics over 15 years back. This is actually a curve that uh, my prof had actually published in 2007, where he called out the bandwidth distance product as a key figure of merit for all these communications links and how that has changed over time. So back in 1960s, the transition from copper to optical cables for com long haul communication actually happened in a figure of merit uh, bandwidth distance product of around 10 megabits per second times kilometer. In fact, if you actually zoom into this 1970s, the first transition actually happened to multimode optics. And the first deployment of single mode optics for this long haul communication happened around uh, 85 gigabits per second kilometer in 1980s. Now, fast forwarding 50 years in current data centers, the transition to multimode happens still at around 10 megabits per second per kilometer. And single mode optics still happens at around 100 gigabits per second kilometer. This is truly fascinating that even after 50 years, um, these transition points have hardly changed even in our big data centers. It's even more astonishing given the level of technology advances the world has actually seen in this last 50 years. One of the most prominent being AI and ML technology. AI and ML or artificial intelligence is currently being adopted in pretty much everyday life, starting with like speech recognition in your smartphones to targeted ads in your Google search to product recommendations in e-commerce, to internet of things, to autonomous driving, to smart fan manufacturing, you name it. In fact, if you look ahead, it's gonna be a foundational building block for future technologies as well, like 6G, Web 3.0, Metaverse, blockchain, digital twins, any big jargon that you hear out there, AI is pretty much a part of that. I actually came across a research by Google employees or Googlers like they call themselves that I think captures the potential of this technology. The breakthrough that I am talking about is in the field of language modeling. It's a field where uh, all these researchers actually trained a computer to be able to answer mathematical questions like the one listed here. For example, if this, this was a legitimate question that was asked to a, a computer where Tracy was used a piece of wire four feet long to support tomato plants in the garden. The wire was cut into pieces six inches long. How many pieces did she obtain? Now this is, um, when this question was fed into a model that was trained with like a 62 param billion parameters language model, 
it didn't really return the right answer. Uh, it's pretty anticlimactic. It ended up multiplying instead of dividing, right? Um, but when they actually increased the number of parameters from 62 billion by almost 9x to like 540 billion parameters, it actually returned the right answer in complete sentence. It actually converted the feet to inches and then made the right division. This is truly fascinating. It's just and when I saw this for the first time, I was truly taken aback by, uh, by the progress of these technologies. But as you can see, these models, they require and pro uh, processing and training of hundreds of billions of data parameters. And these models are only growing over time. This is an ex essentially captures how many parameters of these models have been um, used over the years, right? And what you see is like back in 2017, the models that used to be used didn't use as many parameters as what is currently being used in 2022. In fact, over the last five years, we have actually seen an exponential growth with over five orders of magnitude in terms of these model sizes. We are talking about over trillion parameters in all these models. So what does it really take to process trillion parameters of models in a, in a cloud compute scenario? So let's take a look at how an infrastructure uh, would look like for processing such really big models. So this is an example of state-of-the-art AI accelerator network infrastructure that NVIDIA actually built, built on its DGX H100 servers. What you see here are what we call racks. And uh, any given data center actually has like hundreds and thousands of these racks communicating with one another using these optical cables that you can see in these blue colors. Right? And even within these racks, you either have optical cables or copper wires that actually connect them together. So if you zoom out, what you would what you can think about is an extremely large network of computers that are talking to one another using optical cables. That's pretty much what a data center is. Now uh, let's zoom in to how uh, the architecture even further. Each of these data center racks is called a node, right? And within each node, you have up to eight GPUs that are communicating with one another using custom links called NV links, that NVIDIA's proprietary link. Each of these links have a bandwidth of over 4.8 terabits per second. Now, each of these nodes are communicating with one another using uh, a switch called a leaf switch. And each of the bandwidth of these links are around 200 gigabits per second. So if you want to have node one communicate to node 20, it would have to go through either leaf one or leaf eight switch in order to transmit any information. So in this way, you end up making a bigger network of computers or servers. Now you can grow the size of these uh, uh, interconnect even further by introducing another uh, a switch called a spine switch. And this kind of a network topology is actually called a fat tree topology. Now, what, what does it really mean is you have another switch that interconnects all these leaf switches together. That way you can have node one can talk to node 61 through the leaf switch, going into the spine switch, going into the leaf 25 switch and going back to node 61 switch. Now, every big hyperscaler have their own way of like interconnecting all these networks together. But the crux of the matter is you have a big pool of server elements that needs to talk to one another 
and you need to choose the right set of interconnects in order for you to be able to um, reach a really high performance. Now, in, the, in this ecosystem, what you currently notice all these interconnects that are currently communicating at 200 gigabits per second. However, if you think about within node bandwidth, if these eight GPUs talking to one another at 4.8 terabits per second bandwidth. Now, if I really want to retain the performance of such a cluster, ideally, I would like to have a same sort of like communication bandwidth outside the node as well. If, if you really want to support next generation models, what do I mean by that? Um, in, in future models, you're going to have thousands and hundreds and thousands of these nodes communicating with one another, which, and these nodes are up to like 50 meters apart. So ideally I need terabits per second of bandwidth if I want to retain and scale the performance without um, uh, seeing any bottleneck. However, as you can notice over here, that's actually not true. What you see here is a, a, a Interconnect bandwidth is around 200 gigabits per second compared to like 4.8 terabits per second, which acts as a key bottleneck, right? If you actually uh, compare how it has scaled over the years, any GPU bandwidth over the years have increased linearly and even like on memory bandwidth of like um, uh, interconnects have also scaled linearly. But unfortunately this internode NIC bandwidth, as we call it, doesn't necessarily scale. It's pretty much remained flat. So scaling all these interconnect bandwidth is really critical if you really want to support next generation AI and ML workloads. So now that we have established that scaling the bandwidth is extremely critical, it's equally important to focus on how we scale this bandwidth. There was a study that was actually done at UMass Amherst where researchers tried to quantify the contribution of our everyday activity towards carbon dioxide emissions. Now, this is actually very important because it is actually estimated that if we don't cut our carbon emissions by half over the next decade, it's not gonna be uh, sufficient for us to be able to deter any escalating rates of natural disaster. In fact, the article that was published over five years back, it talks about how air travel is actually bad for the world's carbon footprint. So investments in clean tech is gaining more traction as well. So they started with treating this air travel as a baseline and quantified how much air travel would actually um, take in terms of the carbon footprint. Turns out not so much compared to other um, potential sources of carbon. Turns out in fact, an average human over a period of one year consumes more electricity and power compared to an air travel of a passenger going from San Francisco to New York. And of course, Americans are above average uh, when it comes to power consumption and uh, carbon footprint. Now, all these seem actually seem insignificant when you compare the carbon footprint generated over a car's lifetime. Can anyone guess how much, what would this block correspond to? Um, this is actually the carbon emissions associated with training one deep learning model. Right. This is actually 6x of how much a car over an entire lifetime consumes in terms of the carbon dioxide emissions and the carbon footprint. And we all know how valuable this problem was that there was a big company that was actually um, invested in it and currently valued at $800 billion in, as of yesterday. So we have established that solving this problem is valuable and most importantly, it's extremely critical 
if we want to have a sustainable future. And we also need to, at the end of the day, we are all in the business of uh, uh, making money as well. So we need to think about how we actually uh, solve it in a sustainable and also an affordable manner. And what's not becoming affordable is the uh, CMOS uh, development cost that has increased over time. What you see here is a plot of an average design cost on a CMOS node. It used to cost over um, 28 million in a, in a 65 nanometer node. And right now it's actually gone up by almost 20X or 30X in a five nanometer node. We are talking about almost half a billion dollar would be needed to design on a CMOS five nanometer node. Similarly, um, in, this is actually a, a study published by AMD that talks about the product cost actually has gone up equally by almost 5x going from 45 nanometer to 5 nanometer. In fact, with latest um, geopolitical tensions and semiconductor shortage, these uh, costs are only going to get worse. So as we talk about designing next generation AI server chips and hardware. Not only do we need to think about affordability, uh, affordability in terms of development and sustainability in terms of energy consumption. We also need to think about how we can actually be more efficient in all these designs. And that's exactly what I mean by um, uh, designing extremely dense solutions. The more uh, higher the density of these designs, the more area that you, uh, the lesser area that you would use and lesser would be the die cost. Because each of these elements, all these elements scale with, the cost of these elements scale with area. So the need for high escape density solution for this interconnects actually stems from the need for reducing the cost of the CMOS time. So far, we've established the need for high bandwidth distance product, which is basically reach, energy efficiency of these solutions, and bandwidth density when we think about a new interconnect platform for a sustainable AI. So I would like to um, use Gordon Moore's plot that actually captures all this in his figure of merit when he talks about interconnect of the future. What you see on the y-axis is a product of bandwidth density and energy efficiency, and the x-axis is the interconnect distance. And you see the performance of various interconnects um, on, on these uh, key figure of merits. When we talk about um, distances, interconnect distances as le less as like five millimeters, we are typically talking about in package interconnects. What do I mean by that? Within a package, you have multiple dies and they are communicating with one another using links that are as short as five millimeter. In this regime, CMOS happens to be fairly efficient. This is an example of an AMD EPIC package. And uh, the performance of these interconnects are fairly energy efficient over this short distance. As we uh, navigate into like tens of centimeters, um, we are still dealing with onboard interconnects where these electrical signals go onto the board. And there's an example of an NVIDIA DGX uh, server where you have two packages communicating with one another over like 10 centimeters. Again, um, you still notice a need um, fairly efficient um, solutions over there in terms of energy efficiency. It does decrease mainly because the channel losses go up and you need to consume and they end up consuming more power because of that. And as the interconnect distance continue to increase, say to hundreds of meters, that's when optics becomes very interesting and pretty much being the, the only source of communication of the boot. 
uh, this is an image of an NVIDIA Selim um, data, uh, data center rack solution uh, where you have optical uh, links communicating within tens of meters. Now, based on what we discussed for AI and ML workloads, we are looking at the y-axis values of over one terabits per second per millimeter. And uh, we are looking for reaches of around hundreds of meters. Right. Um, so what that really means is this is the desired um, interconnect performance that we would need to support next generation. AI and ML workloads. So I typically use the word IO and interconnect interchangeably. IO really stands for input and output, which is nothing but like communicating in and out of the chip. And that's pretty much um, established by using an interconnect. <clears throat> so, um, what we have established is a next generation AI workload would actually need a completely new interconnect paradigm um, that has efficiency and density of the CMOS and reach of optics. So we are talking about a new figure of merit for these data centers, which is around 100 gigabits per second per millimeter times kilo, kilometers. So uh, how do we really achieve uh, such an interconnect platform. So in order to understand that, let's first understand why the energy efficiency of this optical interconnects is extremely low. So when we talk about these optical interconnects, we are really talking about a legacy pluggable transceiver architecture. It, um, in such an architecture, um, what your uh, thinking about is a system where you essentially have like a switch ASIC that has uh, what we call a long reach series. Um, and it actually transmits signals that goes through these cop through packages and these copper traces that are tens of centimeters. And as these electrical signals tra travel through these PCBs and substrates, they encounter a lot of loss because especially at extremely high speed, when you're talking about 100 gigabits per second, these copper traces become extremely lossy. So on the other end, as soon as they enter, you typically have a pluggable transceiver uh, that gets uh, um, on the other side of the connector. And you have a chip called a digital signal processing service chip that actually takes these uh, copper traces and it basically recovers the loss uh, that it suffered through this entire channel. And then it also recovers the clock and data and before it actually gets converted to optics. So this is an image of, uh, of how a transceiver would uh, look. And you, what you notice are these like DSP surdes and all these optical elements where the DSP surges uh, read times uh, the electrical signals and then transmits back into the optical signal, right? And uh, here I'm just calling out a schematic of such a, a transceiver. And what are the usual terms that are used for that? We call this side the host side, and um, we call uh, the the interface between the DSP and the optical the line side. And the note is that um, typically, in fact, another purpose of the DSP is to take multiple signals. You basically have like up to eight signals that would come in and it would actually multiplex them into like only four signals with much higher bandwidth. So it serves a lot of purpose apart from like channel loss recovery. It does a lot of retiming and maxing together. Now, um, uh, turns out that the, um, when you talk about the energy consumption of such a transceiver, this circuitry actually ends up consuming over 50% of the entire transceiver power, and thereby contributing the overall inefficiency of these optical pluggables. So this is actually a breakdown of uh, a transceiver power where clock and data recovery, which is basically another way of saying DSP uh, circuitry, consumes around 52% compared to like 48% from all the other components. 
So one way to actually improve the energy efficiency associated with this uh, system would be to actually reduce this channel. Right. Um, what do I mean by that? Bring, bring these entire circuit closer to the switch so that the copper, you don't necessarily see such high loss and the you don't necessarily have to uh, use a, a high power DSP in order to recover all these uh, um, channel losses. So that's essentially what motivates um, motivated people to actually look into an architecture called onboard optics, where you take this front plane pluggable and you bring them closer to the switch dam, thereby reducing the trace length and improving the overall energy efficiency. And a next generation implementation of it is what we talk about when we say co-packaged optics, which is basically taking this entire uh, module and putting it on the same package as that of the switch silicon. By that, you are essentially getting re reducing the channel length drastically and simplifying the channel to an extent where you don't need a lot of uh, um, electronic circuitry to recover all these signals. This is how a cross section of such a co packaged optical system would look like. Where wherever you, you wherever you used to have like front plane pluggable, the optical engine pretty much um, we move that from uh, the legacy front plane pluggable to the same package as that of the switch silicon. So uh, co packaged optics is a, essentially a system level optimization of this IO where what we do is essentially bring the optics much closer to the switch, thereby reducing the overall system power. Now, um, turns out that as um, the interface between the switch and the engine becomes extremely critical when, it, when you talk about the overall system power. And as I had just established how the DSP power is all about um, associated with engineering of this interface. Um, so for example, if you had a really short retimed interface, you would pretty much, you still need to, if you still consume power in retiming this channel uh, because of the loss, you would end up consuming more power than what if you directly, if the channel is extremely low loss and if you directly draw in an analog drive fashion. So this is essentially a plot that actually compares all these various configuration. And what we found out was co-packaging the photonic engine um, in, in a solid chiplet formation where this interface is extremely short and extremely dense, gives you the maximum uh, IO efficiency compared to all the other configurations where you would actually need some sort of a retimer circuitry. What you notice here is um, um, a comparison of front plane pluggable to onboard optics to a next generation onboard optics, which is basically nothing but increasing the size of the substrate and having some sort of a socketed interface of an optical module against a configuration where you actually had all these optical engines that are actually co-packaged in the same package using a soldered interface. This uh, configuration translates to highest density, lowest channel loss, and lowest power. Please note that there is a clean uh, relation between density of the interface and the power associated with the overall system. The farther the uh, interfaces are, the longer the channel is and the higher the power. So I keep talking about it mainly because uh, you cannot, uh, density doesn't only contribute to cost, but it also contributes to the overall energy of the entire system. So um, uh, the ideal solution would actually involve pitch matching the engine IOs to that of the switch IOs. 
that would actually maximize the density and reduce the channel length um, drastically. So when we really think about co-packaged optics, what we are thinking about is essentially a system level IO optimization and essentially co-optimization with various technologies. Each, here is a list of like all the key technology building blocks that would be needed for a CPU. In, that includes silicon photonics, laser, CMOS and bi-CMOS ICs, um, advanced packaging for all these chiplet integration, high density optical connectivity and fiber attach, um, and oh, bringing the entire system together uh, in a thermal, mechanical and power, um, thinking about power delivery and the embedded software associated with that as well. So when we talk about designing such a system, we always need to think about what is the main figure of merit for the system. We talked about energy efficiency, bandwidth density and reach. I'm also including the elements of cost and supply chain resiliency given the uh, geopolitical situation and the greater reliance on supply chain um, uh, independence. Right? So, so when we think about each of these building blocks, we would need to think about developing the technology, keeping the system level figure of merit in mind. So let's look at how we approach individual technology development building blocks, starting with silicon photonics. So what silicon photonics? I really like this um, example provided by Intel, where you look at, if you take any traditional 100G based optical transmitter, um, a legacy tra transceiver typically has a lot of discrete optical components like lasers, modules, and lenses, uh, and PDs uh, that need to be manually glued. Silicon photonics actually offers the ability to integrate all these discrete components into a single component on a single piece of silicon that can actually fit in your thumb. In fact, even much smaller than the size of a thumb. So we are talking about over tens and twenties of components on a single piece of silicon. It not only integrates all the functionality, but it also simplifies the assembly steps where, you, where here what you notice is like almost 26 assembly steps um, getting reduced to almost just two. So you reduce the number of uh, components and you increase the throughput associated with this. So when you talk about silicon, you, can, you really start thinking about using and leveraging wafer scale manufacturing using legacy foundries. So you can uh, leverage traditional CMOS semiconductor ecosystem to mass produce these devices in foundries a fraction of what all these discrete bomb alternatives would actually cost. So these are some of the devices that are currently um, printed at wafer level. These includes like modulators for electrical to optical data conversion, photo detectors for converting the optical data to electrical data, uh, MMI splitters that actually split the light uh, in various proportions. And you have other passive devices like wave guiding for propagating the light. And you have couplers that actually couples the light in and out of the device. So silicon photonics is nothing but a wafer scale integration of optical elements that pretty much change the game of how we think about scaling all these transceiver elements in high volume. So when it comes to a CPO system, let's think about how do we 
focus on silicon photonics technology development, keeping the figure of uh, system level figure of merit in mind. So if we want to design for maximizing energy efficiency, the technology blocks that we would think about is like high efficient modulators that um, consume lesser voltage swing, thereby reducing the power. High responsivity PDs that uh, efficiently utilize, convert the optical data to electrical data. Low loss waveguides and couplers that translate to needing lower energy for light propagation. Now, when it comes to bandwidth density, you're talking about uh, these structures. How small can you really make them? Can you meet like shoreline density that are over two terabits per second? Can you fit two terabits per second of bandwidth in just a millimeter of beach front? And another element, a technology that would be needed for bandwidth density purposes is integrated MUX and DMUX. And you really need like smaller pitch of all these like optical IOs for coupling the light and uh, uh. and MUX and DMUX is nothing but um, uh, having multiple wavelengths uh, multiplex together on a single waveguide. So as we can multiplex multiple wavelengths on a single waveguide, uh, you don't uh, you reduce you drastically reduce the footprint needed in terms of communicating these high bandwidth. You can actually transmit two terabits of uh, bandwidth on a single waveguide, which is a few microns uh, in width. So when we talk about reach, um, what we need to think about is how do we actually design for low propagation loss? And when we talk about cost, we always think about how dense can we really make it? Like how can we minimize the silicon area? And finally, when we talk about supply chain resiliency, um, the photonic designers really need to think about how they can actually standardize the PDK across various foundry ecosystem. So a roadmap for uh, silicon photonics for a CPU should actually drive uh, something uh, like a PPS scaling of a photonics with a standardized foundry ecosystem. What do I mean by PPA? It stands for power, performance, and area scaling. And I borrowed this terminology from a CMOS world where um, it is widely used for defining a CMOS technology roadmap. Now, uh, transmitting optical data actually needs an optical power supply source. And that's our next building block, which is the laser which is nothing but an optical power supply, and it can emit um, uh, uh, multiple wavelengths that can eventually get multiple, where you can encode single piece of information in each of these multiple wavelengths. Now, converting to optical data would not make any sense if uh, the power associated with um, optical uh, data actually is higher than electrical data. So that's where wall plug efficiency, which is basically a fraction of how much of electrical power would you really need to get uh, an optical power is key in terms of justifying this optical communication. So on the left are three widely popular um, uh, configurations of lasers that are currently deployed. So the most popular one is a DFB laser. Um, uh, which so if you want to um, emit multiple wavelengths, you you have a single uh, DFB for particular wavelength, and if you have multiple wavelengths, you use arrays of these DFB. And this is currently actually shipping in volume in all these legacy data center uh, configurations. Um, there are other. Uh, uh, multi wavelength laser sources that are currently coming up. Um, one of this is an, a mode lock laser where you can use a single piece of laser and emit multiple wavelengths from a single uh, laser source. The other one is a comb laser that uh, some of you might have actually listened in the last webinar about uh, curve generated uh, comb. Um, 
that is used for multi-wavelength uh, link communications. Now, generating these multiple wavelengths from a single laser source can actually prove to be truly scalable and cost-effective. It's very similar to how um, silicon photonics pretty much changed the game by integrating a lot of components on a single piece of silicon. The comb laser can uh, uh, do a similar thing by actually uh, integrating all these DFB arrays on a single piece of uh, silicon as well. <clears throat> so, um, having uh, looked at the optical portion of it, let's get to the uh, electronic circuitry that are critical in terms of like, uh, sorry, uh, let's look at the systems figure of merit that are actually driving all this like laser technology. So when it comes to energy efficiency, we need to start thinking about uncooled laser operation that can go up to like ATC. When it comes to bandwidth density, we are talking about multi-wavelength generation uh, that would be needed out of this laser technology. To get to the reach, um, we really need high optical power uh, in order to support long reaches of these optical interconnects. Now, how do we develop a technology for cost? The first thing we would do is we need to look into uncooled laser implementation that would eliminate the tech cost. If we take the laser out um, and do an external configuration, you also save some silicon area in applications like CPU that also saves cost. Um, and uh, uh, in applications that, uh, that involve uh, pluggable, um, you would actually need to integrate this to, again, for achieving the high density. Now, a supply chain resiliency for laser would involve standardizing the uh, laser uh, vendor ecosystem. And there are like a lot of efforts going on in like external laser standardization uh, for ensuring vendor interoperability, thereby um, ensuring supply chain resiliency. So the key is designing high efficiency, low cost laser is extremely critical when you're thinking about scaling all these CPO links for AI and ML applications. So now let's look at like interface, electrical interface scaling. In any traditional CMOS system, we care about ICs for four different functionalities. Um, we need the actual electrical data interface IO, uh, for which typically we use CMOS uh, technology. Uh, we need uh, something that can drive all these modulators where we've seen both CMOS and by CMOS being implemented. We need a clock and data recovery circuit, uh, which is again, a digital circuit typically employed in CMOS. And we would need a trans impedance amplifier, which actually takes the optical photo current that you get out of photodiodes and converts it into uh, electrical, um, converts it into voltage and then amplifies it so that it can be received on the receiver side of the CMOS circuitry. So typically, a uh, uh, BiCMOS uh, provides um, higher sensitive trans impedance amplifier. And now there are also like design innovations that are happening in CMOS that actually can scale as well. So when it comes to um, CMOS technologies, uh, we are well aware of how Moore's law talks about how the gate length actually uh, reduces over time. Uh, this is a typical technology roadmap of, um, that was published in, in a semiconductor report. And what you notice is like uh, a stark difference between what 2013 showed and what 2015 showed, right? And uh, the key thing that you notice is like the rate, uh, the progress of development is actually like slowing down, all right? So we talked about like uh, planar gate devices back in 2013, um, the industry transition to a FinFET based uh, CMOS devices for like 10 nanometer nodes and beyond. And eventually uh, we are, uh, Intel actually is talking about gate all, all around configuration for a three nanometer node. 
So um, not only is the rate of development flattening, but it also um, getting more complex and the cost, as I had shown before, is skyrocketing. And fundamentally, all this performance scaling is only marginal and maybe even insignificant for analog circuits uh, that are actually fundamental for um, photonics. This has actually motivated the need for various chiplet integration schemes. Right. <clears throat> So let's think, uh, look at how um, systems figure out when it is driving the IC technology. Now, when we talk about energy efficiency, we really need to think about low voltage drivers and high sensitivity TIAs and extremely low loss, uh, uh, extremely highly efficient die to die interface IP. Here, there are interfaces out there that consume only 0.35 picojoules per bit of uh, IO uh, power. Um, like, uh, I think UCI is one example, and then there are other parallel interfaces like BOW and AIB that are coming up as well. Um, then there is like a bandwidth density. When you're talking about bandwidth density, again, the, the figure of merit has not changed. We would need a, a really dense circuit that can support high bandwidth escape of around two terabits per second per millimeter. And when it comes to reach, um, there are uh, IPs that are actually designed depending upon the reach of all these like copper channels, right? Uh, so we are, we typically think about like serial interfaces for like LR and MR um, links uh, for longer reach and parallel interfaces for relatively shorter reach like die to die interface uh, as well. When it comes to cost, I mean, we keep talking about reducing the silicon area, higher density, and making the right node choice as well. And that's where the chiplet integration scheme comes in. And supply chain resiliency is all about standardization of interfaces across vendors. So, um, uh, CMOS is PPS scaling is actually plattering for analog. So we need to think about chiplet architecture. And we also need to think about how to actually scale by CMOS for higher density uh, with much lower defect uh, density. So all these chiplets uh, that we are talking about are currently not shipped out as bare dice. They're actually shipped out as a packaged die uh, to an end customer. Um, this is an example that I had shown before of an AMD server chip uh, that is currently shipped to an end customer. And as you notice, it's actually a packaged a die with a, with a lid on it. Um, and this is an example of a packaged silicon photonic die um, that is currently shipping in volume. Notice a significant mismatch in terms of how they look and the form factor and everything around it. Um, so co-packaging is actually a marriage of these two worlds, of CMOS and optical packaging. So before we get into co-packaging, let's try to understand what advanced packaging is. Right? When you talk about advanced packaging, you hear a lot of these like uh, jargons around like through silicon vias and chip on wafer, bumping, system and package, uh, multi-dice stacking. Uh, so, uh, but what I really want to get into is um, uh, I would like to start with like fundamentals and then get into um, advanced packaging. Uh, let me see. Uh, so, Bijoy, uh, how am I doing on time? How many more minutes do I have or am I done? Let me, uh, let me check the time. Yeah, I think you can go, go ahead. I think uh, already 54 minutes, so, but yeah. So, you okay. can okay. another five minutes you can go for, then you can go for QA and that. So that's another hand there. Okay. All right. So uh, when we talk about uh, packaging, what we really think about is um, um, uh, traditional dies, which is the most popular one. You have dies with certain pads. You have a PCB with uh, uh, certain gold pads, and you typically think about like wire bonding um, these pads uh, to a PCB. This is the most popular form of packaging. 
right? And uh, it's extremely, it's low cost, very cheap. But the key uh, constraint here is low escape bandwidth density associated with these packages, right? Um, so that's where the need for 2D uh, packaging came in, where you need to uh, uh, so enable fan out of 2D signals, right? And um, that gave rise to what we call organic substrates, where it enables taking dyes that actually have IOs that are extremely small pitches, like 80 to 200 microns, and we need to fan it out to pitches that are as high as like 700 microns to a millimeter. And substrates act as an interposer that actually translates and fans out this uh, signal uniformly. Right? And this is an example of an FCBGA substrate, uh, which stands for flip chip ball grid array, where you see a die on a substrate that eventually gets mounted onto a PCB. So substrate is nothing but a fan out of 2D array of electrical signals, right? Um, the cross section actually gets this point, right? So what you see here is um, um, all these electrical signals fanning out uh, through alternate layers of um, organic and copper material, right? Um, these organic substrates pretty much changed the game of uh, advanced packaging because it, it reduced and um, reduced the overall packaging to the die cost and kept the cost curve pretty low. Right? Um, when you think about like multi-chip packaging, what we are really thinking about is uh, reducing uh, the distance between two dies and increasing the IO density between two dies by actually packaging them together on the same package. Right. In this scenario, this is, uh, um, I keep coming back to this multi-chip co-package because this is nothing but a co-packaged architecture. Right? Now, uh, when we talk about advanced packaging, it's basically taking this interposer and increasing the density even further by actually um, putting them on a piece of silicon, which has much finer RDL rules. So you can bring the dice much closer together and you can get IO per millimeter, which is almost like 5X of what you get in like a traditional MCP. So when you hear all this like advanced packaging uh, jargons, just, just think about having uh, dice, how can we bring two dice together as close as possible and limit the density, make it really uh, high density, uh, ensure a high density interconnect and enable a chiplet integration scheme. Right, so when we think about uh, uh, designing for um, uh, advanced uh, packaging technologies uh, to enable next generation systems, we are really thinking about, uh, again, how do we actually reduce the channel loss between these dyes? How close can we actually stack them together? Um, how can we enable panel level processing? And how can I, I we actually end up standardizing all these uh, substrates and packaging architecture so that multiple vendors can actually enable doing that? And this is uh, this is nothing new. It's actually a significantly big market. Uh, there is a lot of investment that has gone into this semiconductor packaging ecosystem, right? And um, uh, the, the market is expected to reach almost fifty billion dollars. So there is a lot of investment that has gone into it. And the whole promise of silicon photonics is the ability to leverage this ecosystem in order to um, it can in order to achieve optical IO on a same package as that of switch silicon. Now, this entire thing cannot actually be realized without seamlessly integrating optical um, solutions on it. And that brings me to the biggest uh, problem statement, which is the optical coupling. So until now, I, uh, people, uh, the entire industry has thought about um, coupling between uh, uh, of light as coupling between a photonic dye to a fiber. That I call, if you really think about it, you should draw parallels between like um, a dye um, and photonic uh, interface and PCB and fiber. And what the industry has uh, uh, done so far is solve this wire bonding problem in the, in the photonics community, right? 
Um, so these are all various implementations of how we can directly attach dye uh, to a fiber in a passive line, um, in a passive manner, right? But unfortunately, uh, none of these uh, solutions are compatible with, most of the solutions are actually not compatible with an OSAT and a Chiplati ecosystem when it comes to wafer scale integration and process integration, right? In fact, um, with discrete optics is actually more compatible than traditional like um, V groove and fiber solutions. Um, thereby resulting in we still have a problem of around like packaging over die of over like 30 to 50 percent. Right. So uh, if you really think about it, there is actually no real substrate equivalent in optics industry. And we talked about almost 50 billion dollar industry in electronic uh, ecosystem. And there is no such equivalent in the optics industry. That's really a big gap um, that I currently see, right? Um, so uh, what I would force this community to think about is uh, a high density optical fan of solution. Um, and think about figure off merits along the lines of like energy efficiency, bandwidth density, reach, cost. Here I'm listing out uh, a relevant set of um, parameters uh, when we think about a solution space for such an ecosystem. Um, even the interest of time, I don't want to get into the details of it, but I would be happy to have a have another offline discussion with people that are interested in this. So the final building block when it comes to co-packaged optics is essentially um, uh, integrating this entire system together. And there we really think about next generation power deliveries and thermal solutions. In fact, Intel recently announced a $700 million investment in developing next generation immersion cooling solutions for data centers. Right? Um, so yeah, I mean, there is a lot of uh, um, problems in uh, thermals that need to be solved. There is a problem in power delivery that needs to be solved. And everything needs to be solved within the constraints of this system figure of merits, uh, including energy efficiency, bandwidth density, reach, and cost. Right. Um, so, uh, at, when it comes to system, one thing I want you to take away from it is like standardization and energy centric approach to system design is always key to ensure like a sustainable and scalable solution. Right. And uh, when I'm talking about code designs, I'm all, not only talking about overall system and technology co-design, but also thinking about software. Uh, depending upon the AI and ML workloads that would be needed, uh, it, it's important to think about co-optimizing AI ML workloads with the overall system design as well. So to summarize, um, AI footprint in our daily life is actually going to increase in the foreseeable future. So it's imperative that we enjoy the benefits, but in a very sustainable and affordable manner, right? We need to embrace an energy centric approach. And when we think about a design of this enabling infrastructure, silicon photonics is actually a key enabler uh, in ensuring that, but um, we cannot realize full potential of it uh, without investments in accompanying ecosystems of packaging and test. Thank you. Well, that uh, was a virtual clap from me. <laughs> nice talk, Vivek. Thank you for uh, spending your early hours with us. So that's one of the, can you just switch on your video? Be better. Yeah. Yeah. Can you see me? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, so that was an interesting talk. Um, Thanks, Vivek, for sort of going through very patiently and slowly. I, I think I really appreciated um, the fact that you cleared up some of the basics, um, given the wide nature of the audience that we have. Um, I also noticed that uh, we have someone from Ranavas and also from Mel's uh, in our attendee list. So uh, quite a global reach uh, on this particular topic. So, um, because it's usually uh, audience from India, um, as I see most of the time. So anyway, uh, this is the first of our uh, industry talks uh, in this webinar series. So uh, it's nice to kick off 
things and give students some perspective on what industry needs and what industry is looking at, what kind of problems is interesting to them. Uh, I'll probably share a short anecdote in the end of the Q&A session. So we have someone uh, who's been pretty active on the Q&A box. Uh, we can probably start with his questions first. Uh, his name is Yeshwant Muniala. Um, he has several questions for us. Um, first of which is, uh, what does the photonic engine contain and how far can it be scaled down? Okay, so uh, fundamentally, when we talk about photonic engine, um, uh, the industry, there is a lot of, um, inconsistency in the terminology. Uh, so let me just like clear up what I mean by it, which is um, uh, an ability to take electrical signal, some sort of an electronic circuitry that takes the electrical signal um, and converts it into optical signal. So this includes um, uh, a pretty much like a driver IC, TIA, and then photonic uh, uh, integrator circuit. That's pretty much and the ability to couple the light out, which includes like some sort of a fiber interface. So that in, and in some cases, we end up including even the third three timer block in there, but essentially taking a signal out and converting into optical signal, everything that would be needed in order to enable that, I guess what um, a photonics engine should contain. Okay, so yeah, to, uh, to uh, I hope uh, that answers your question, Yashwan. So the, all the scaling laws that pertain to each of those building blocks that Vivek mentioned will pertain to this as well. Um, so your, his second question is more in the lines of uh, CMOS technology. Uh, we have exhausted the CMOS technology performance. How else can we optimize the CMOS and by CMOS other than just scaling down? Um, I, I think that's essentially where uh, we are currently thinking about overall system uh, co-optimization. And um, I briefly touched upon that subject of chiplet integration, right? So uh, um, if you really think about it, uh, the, uh, the optimization, uh, we are reaching the end mainly because on the compute side, there is only so much we can do. Right and right now, a big portion of the power is actually consumed in all these like CMOS and by CMOS IC in communicating that uh, information to the external world, right? And uh, the promise that we are making is how do we actually take all these um, uh, blocks that can actually compute really efficiently, but in uh, reduce the communication overhead associated with all these blocks, and uh, that way we can scale the system performance in a very seamless manner, right? Even with the existing ICs. So that can be done by what we call chiplet integration, where you take a CMOS chiplet and you take a bi CMOS chiplet and you take a photonic chiplet and you closely pack them together so that they look like one big chip. So for, uh, for someone who is basically looking at it for the very first time would not be able to see a difference between how it currently looks uh, versus like a standard monolithic die that would uh, uh, look differently. Uh, both of them look like, look the same when you look at the final package, right? So the key is to dense integration of chiplets, and that's what is called heterogeneous integration. And that actually offers more functionality and it ensures overall system power and performance scaling as well. All right. Um, here is a very radical question, uh, sort of puzzling me itself. Uh, from Yashwant again, can we remove copper completely from a packaging aspect? Uh, uh, copper completely from the packaging aspect. Um, I think um, um, eventually, uh, I think there are elements there. Um, theoretically, yes. Uh, but I think uh, it's not, uh, again, when we go back to the figure of merit of the energy efficiency, I don't think it will be energy efficient to remove copper directly completely from the package, right? And that's basically, um, and I can get into the details. Uh, there's probably way too many details in there for that. But uh, the short answer is theoretically yes, but I don't think it's, um, it's, it's an optimum solution from a system standpoint. So probably uh, the 
Driver electronics co integration would help. Uh, driver electronics co integration on, on a compute would help. So, really imagine, I think uh, CMOS is really good for uh, if, you're, if you go 10 years into the future, right, or even five years into the future. Uh, CMOS is, uh, has scaled really well when it comes to digital logic, right? So, uh, what you would envision in, in the future would be a scenario where uh, you have core digital logic that is being performed in CMOS and then seamlessly translate that, directly translate that into optical signals. So use optics only for communication and use CMOS for uh, processing, right? And uh, theoretically you can get rid of, the only way you can get rid of copper from the packaging is to use light for computing as well, essentially, right? And, uh, but then uh, you would still need electrical signal that would have to go in to power all these like optical links, right? So somehow you, you anyway need some sort of a copper interface to provide power. But beyond that, like you can technically get rid of the compute. Uh, you can also do the compute in photonics, but again, it's not energy efficient. And that's basically why uh, the most energy optimum and affordable solution would be to use CMOS and um, for compute and uh, optics for like communication, right? And use advanced packaging for bringing them really, really close together uh, so that you cannot see the difference, uh, tell the difference between whether it is a CMOS die or a photonic die. Okay, so moving on, we have uh, Pratyasha who has shown some interest in the uh, carbon footprint of, of uh, the various examples that you gave us. Um, and she's interested to know how does the uh, carbon footprint for the CMOS industry compares to all those examples given in that slide. Um, I think that's a, a good question, and I don't think um, you want to know the answer to that. Uh, I don't think there is actually research published uh, research on that, uh, at least not that I have seen. Um, it's probably uh, uh, held as a trade secret, but uh, what I would uh, it's a really good study, and I think um, I encourage people like yourself to research more into that and publish that if possible. Um, what I can tell you is, like um, in in future, um, the industry is taking us so seriously that uh, because data center is estimated, even not in uh, 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 foreseeable future, we are talking about uh, six to seven years from now in 2030. Right now, data center consumes less than 1% of the world's power. In 2030, it is estimated to consume over 30% of world's power. So that's the rate at which the power consumption of the data center is going up. Similarly, for the CMOS, um, uh, uh, the, the power consumption associated with the, uh, manufacturing and packaging and all those things, is uh, so critical that uh, they are investing in like renewable sources um, for powering the entire factory. And uh, they have also, I think all the big companies have publicly stated their carbon uh, zero goal by 2030, 2035. Uh, so there are, it is being uh, uh, incorporated as part of the corporate mission, but no one really has like true actual, except for all these anecdotes and uh, articles that I have read here and there, I have not seen a study like this published for a CMOS industry per se. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah. Um, okay, now I'm starting to see a lot more questions. So we have to run through them. Uh, so Ashitosh asks uh, the age old question, can you comment on the challenges involved in uh, integrating the laser on the silicon photonic chip? I think the key challenge is like material mismatch, right? It's indium phosphide, uh, and we are talking about silicon. Um, so you basically have a CTE mismatch. Uh, so, I mean, that's the core of it. Uh, so um, when you have to, so you cannot necessarily grow indium phosphide on silicon. So you have to buy it uh, separately and then you have to bond it on a piece of silicon if you have to integrate it. That's basically what we call hybrid bonding. And we are talking about that, uh, the interface between that uh, has, uh, is a source of a lot of dislocations and uh, um, uh, defects that can result in reliability failures, right? And um, Intel basically has 
done a tremendous job in like developing that and but it took them a long time to get there and now they have they have made strides and you have technologies from juniper intel they are all like talking about building uh, buying off this uh, basically having indium phosphide and then bonding it on a piece of silicon and tailoring that interface to make it as low density as possible right so that's basically when we talk about hybrid laser integration now um, there are other approaches which is involves like just free space coupling and um, uh, um, discrete optics kind of influence solutions and uh, the the key challenge there is basically you have laser light that is extremely small um, you have three microns in in uh, diameter and you have a photonic dye which is also like extremely the the interface to that is also like extremely small like four to five microns so um, any mismatch even if you uh, if you want to couple the light from laser to the photonic dye uh, you cannot, you need to be within like nanometers of precision. Any deviation from that, you are going to uh, result in a lot of uh, loss. And that translates to um, energy efficiency of the overall system, right? And there is a lot of solutions uh, around how we actually couple the light from laser to the photonic dye. All right. Uh, next is from Ankan. Uh, what are the particular constraints for scalability? In this case, I don't know what this means. Uh, okay, let's perhaps. Uh, in this case, other than what, yeah, I don't understand the question either. Yeah, that's okay. I think uh, I can probably go to the next one. As per my understanding, VGA has shown potential for vapor scale testing of PIC. Could you please elaborate what are the particular constraints in this scale for its scalability in optical packaging? VGA has, can you repeat the question? So BGA, I think it's BGA, Bolgrid array, has shown potential for vapor scaling, vapor scale testing of PICs. Um, okay. Could you please elaborate what are the particular constraints in On this scale. scale for its scalability in optical packaging? Yeah, so uh, BG, uh, yeah, I think like what, if I understand it uh, correctly, what you're saying is, um, uh, BG as in basically uh, being able to have solder balls on wafer scale on PIC can be used for testing. Uh, we call it bumping. Right. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, we can use it for testing. Uh, but the main thing is um, it, uh, it is a scalable solution when it comes to electrical interface testing. But unfortunately in, in photonics, uh, we need to do both electrical testing and optical testing. And uh, when we think about like uh, testing uh, RF interfaces, you typically don't have an electronic IC or a driver or a TIA there when you're doing optical uh, wafer scale testing. So what happens is like signal generation and uh, signal detection, it's, there is no trivial way of like identifying um, uh, uh, designing probe cards that can actually generate and detect signal at such high frequency. So we end up resorting to like low frequency signals. So we don't necessarily, there are still challenges around like true scaling of um, RF path, mainly because uh, uh, the, the pitch is not sufficient. And most importantly, the reason the pitch is not uh, compatible is because uh, we cannot get both optical fiber in and also probe in without interfering with each other. So we end up like doing something which involves a compromised solution where we don't test the pick dies, we test like test dies that are neighboring test structures that are neighboring to it that are farther apart. So we are really not really testing photonic dies that are getting into production, but we are using test structure to predict the performance of those which can be uh, pretty impact uh, full when it comes to high channel count and high density solutions. Right? Uh, so there is still like a lot of challenges around like wafer scale testing of photonic circuits. Yeah, I agree. Uh, considering that thermal packaging and reduction in power by moving away from decks, are you looking at active or passive cooling solutions? Um, 
Oh, sorry, I didn't understand. Can you repeat it again? Yeah, so I'm assuming what she means is, uh, I think in one of his slides, you mentioned that people want to get away from text. Yeah. Uh, because they're inefficient. Uh, what else would you then use in order to maintain the package uh, within the set temperature range? Would it be some kind of an active or a passive cooling solution? No, it's not. Uh, there is no cooling solution. I mean, basically, you can think about it as like, uh, um, between like 0 to 70 C, the laser should actually operate between that temperature. So what we designed for is, uh, if I want uh, to operate at 70 C, uh, I want to design a laser which is high power enough at 70 C. And it, when it goes to lower temperature, we just like reduce the current that we send into, which is an electronic circuit that we just like uh, uh, control the current that flows into the laser, right, pump current. So um, when we talk about uh, uh, eliminating the tech, I'm just saying that the laser just need to be more powerful at high power as well. Right? So we really need to focus on how to improve the slope efficiency of these lasers. That's basically the key roadmap uh, for any laser technology, uh, wall plug efficiency of these lasers. Um, right now, the best wall plug efficiency of, of the shelf that is currently out there is like 10% at like uh, 70C. So we need to, Think about how to actually get it to like 30% or 40%. So. Yeah, agreed. Uh, so, next question is from Srikant. Uh, he starts off by thanking you for an excellent and useful presentation. Uh, Co packaged optics seems to be a solution to address giga commerce needs in terms of device to device or device to cloud communication, vastly. Usage is extensive in industries such as avionics, automotive, warehousing. How do you see the driver development to keep pace with hardware evolution for onboard optics? Can you kindly tell us about bottlenecks in driver slash firmware development that can be a potential to a potential issue to focus on? I think like uh, I would, uh, what I would actually uh, encourage you to think about when it comes to embedded software and uh, firmware is um, right now, um, uh, there is no standardization on control architecture. So uh, when we talk about transceiver, uh, there is already like what we call seamless standards. I encourage you to look it up. Um, and so legacy pluggable transceiver uh, they basically have a, a seamless uh, standard compliancy that is well defined, and all the embedded uh, software or like firmware solutions should be complied to that when it comes to timing and laser on, laser off, all these kind of uh, um, protocols. Um, but um, when it comes to co-packaged optics, uh, that standard doesn't exist as of today, and. Um, the reason that doesn't exist is it needs to, uh, it, uh, it is more like a supporting infrastructure uh, that needs uh, that needs to go with like an LTK of any standard ASIC or SOC that is out there, right? And um, uh, which actually ends up um, uh, creating some uh, hurdles around uh, uh, eventual deployment for our end customer because they wouldn't know how to control these optical engines because it's not like off the shelf protocol that they can actually use. Um, so there is industry that is currently looking into uh, how do we actually standardize a control interface for uh, uh, for control management for uh, CPO. Uh, there is a uh, there is a standard body called OIF. Uh, so I encourage you to look into that. Uh, the other standardization where embedded software can actually help us, like RLM, like remote laser module standardization as well where how do you actually control the communication between remote laser module and the photonic engine? And um, uh, there is still like a lot of debate around where the brain of this entire uh, control scheme should lie, whether it should be on the la photonics or it should be within the laser, or should it be actually on the board of the end customer? Um, and um, we have actually promoted that it should be on the board and it should be uh, swappable with the traditional firmware uh, microcontrollers and maybe uh, current uh, server hardware already have FPGAs on them. So we've actually pushed for those kind of implementations in the past, but um, uh, it's not clear how that is going to eventually get deployed. So there is still uh, like a lot of uh, opportunity there to innovate and uh, see how we can actually um, 
make it compatible with existing server infrastructure. So I encourage you to look at OIF and OCP to get more details around that. Thank you. I think uh, Yashwant has a follow-up uh, to his question on copper and getting rid of copper. Um, I think what he was trying to uh, ask was more of a materials question in the sense that can we actually use organic materials to replace copper that can say conduct and have low loss uh, yeah i don't uh, i don't know of any organic material that can that can uh, that can conduct better than copper uh, i mean i would encourage you to look into it but always think about uh, always think about the end um, value proposition right so to the end system right now copper um, is an extremely mature ecosystem the cost is extremely low so when you think about like industry deployment and innovations uh, whatever you are proposing as a technology solution should actually provide at least 10 to 20x benefit over existing ecosystem in terms of performance um, otherwise the barrier to adoption is going to be very high so we are not uh, going to go for a similar performance, but uh, of an organic material, they go for 10x or 20x better performance, higher density. So try to see how that solution can tie into those figure of merits that I detailed out. And uh, if you can justify the investment because of significant uh, uh, improvement in the figure of merit, uh, then I'm sure there is a scope for that uh, technology. Okay, I hope uh, you're happy with that answer, Yashwan. Um, so that's all on the Q&A from the uh, Cisco WebEx. I don't see much on the YouTube channel. Uh, so yeah, uh, Vijay uh, is eager to ask uh, his question. So yeah, we'll open it to the panelists now. So yeah, Vijay, you can go ahead. Yeah, uh, Vivek, it is a fantastic talk. Excellent, I think a lot of information. I think I'm getting a lot of uh, feedback also that people are enjoying. Uh, thank you very much for that. Yeah. So uh, I have a, uh, just a very, uh, I think maybe stupid, I don't know. Uh, so, you know, this transceiver uh, in silicon photonics, photonic engine, that is all uh, we are looking for a uh, short haul, like a data center, mostly we are targeting. Uh, but what about the long haul? What is the limitation? Why why people are not talking about to replace uh, uh, so transmitter, whatever uh, traditional transmitter, mostly maybe lithium navid based modulator? Uh, what is the limitation there for silicon photonics? Because that would help a lot actually uh, because of the scalability etc. All you can enjoy CMOS technology. Yeah, sure. so currently for long haul links, right now there is a, a there is a, a investigation in that, right? And uh, there is something called a new uh, a standard called 400 G ZR standards. What it means is a long haul is all about coherent communication, right? As you might know. Yes. Uh, yes. So the the um, uh, the uh, density associated, the density requirements are uh, just think about why silicon photonics was very powerful is because of the density of uh, density and the cost benefits it had. There, there is no real density constraint to begin with, right? Okay. So then you are competing on cost, and cost you are competing only if you have high volume, right? And otherwise, it becomes very difficult, right? Uh, so uh, fundamentally, in the past, long um, uh, it became difficult to justify uh, uh, the cost associated uh, with uh, meeting the cost targets with such a, a relatively lower volume, right? And um, in the last few years. Uh, what uh, the industry is looking at is all these like uh, ZR coherent links, which are also front plane pluggable, which means uh, all, um, uh, and you can look up 400 ZR, 800 ZR, and Acacia is one of the leading vendors in that uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And they pretty much like own the market in my opinion, and I might be wrong there. Uh, but um, they pretty much change the game with silicon photonics for coherent. And they are actually, uh, but the biggest problem in uh, there is like in coherent, the, uh, you always need a DSP for uh, for all these uh, links, and uh, these DSPs are extremely power consuming, right? 
So co-packaged um, coherent links is going to be challenging in the long run uh, because of the power associated with the PSPs, right? Um, but then um, uh, the the ecosystem is still looking at uh, how do we actually enable coherent links, which is front plane pluggable and meet the power and the thermal targets for uh, in in such a form factor, and. Um, uh, Right now, that volume, uh, there is a significant uh, demand in that space and pretty much like there's a mix of, I would say like there is a mix of uh, silicon photonics and non-silicon photonic solutions there. And I think silicon photonics is becoming more and more relevant because the DSP power is going up with uh, higher order nodes, if going from 400 GZR to 800 GZR to 1.6 coherent light. And um, in order to reduce the power, again, going back to what I talked about, all these like links between DSP to the optics, we need to bring it down closer together and that can actually reduce the overall power of the, uh, of the module, right? So, uh, so photonics packaging with its packaging advantage actually proves to be beneficial now because now we are reaching a tipping point of bandwidth density and power. Um, so now it's uh, becoming slightly more relevant and I think in, again, in the next few years, uh, it's probably going to reach a point where it might actually even replace traditional pluggables. Um, uh, where, because the number of channels is going up 1.6 tera. When you think about 1.6 tera and 3.2 tera, I wouldn't be surprised the um, coherent world and traditional ethernet world will end up like uh, merging together and you will end up start seeing um, uh, um, a single form factor that works for both and uh, standardization, which basically uh, ends up calling out coherent and Ethernet interchangeably and all these things, right? So that is currently happening, um, but it just uh, was not uh, needed until now in terms of density and power. Right? And one just uh, another question frequently uh, I have been uh, asked by my students also. Uh, normally, I don't have answer. Uh, if you can give that. So thing is that normally uh, whenever you are estimating uh, energy savings in silicon photonics engine, uh, you are just uh, saying that, okay, whatever the picojoule per bit or whatever things you are giving the figure of merit, but do you count also the uh, laser power you are consuming or only the just uh, electrical to optical uh, conversion that is what uh, you mean? No, think, no. Uh, we yeah. always need to consider laser power. So when you talk about optical module uh, power consumption, that includes uh, digital signal, basically the serialization, the like clock and data recovery, right. uh, plus uh, driver plus TIA plus laser, and the microcontroller and all those things. So every time you talk about a complete transceiver, and now when we think, think about systems, Sometimes people safely ignore the interface uh, power like XSR or AIB power and uh, they only talk about driver TIA and laser power. But in all the scenarios you account for driver TIA and laser and an ideal situation would be to look at uh, one uh, from point A to point B, what does it take to transmit a piece of information? And that includes like interface power plus uh, uh, transceiver power plus um, um, yeah, again, the interface uh, receiver power on the other end, right? So you need to account for all of them put together. So when I'm talking about like promise of less than a picojoules per bit, I'm yeah. talking about the power it takes to communicate from GPU one to GPU two, everything that is in the path, right? And that includes like laser and um, driver TIA and the interface. Okay, okay. thank you. I'm done, so that's all. Yeah, and Vivek, I had a very quick question um, because on the laser requirement slide, uh, you put a power number, yeah. which was a little uh, daunting. So it said 150 milliwatts. And yeah. you remember that number? Yeah. <laughs> well, right what's that power? Is it from a single wavelength or is it all wavelengths in the guide or in the fiber? Or... Yeah, it's and... basically a single wavelength uh, power. Uh, when you're talking about next generation. Uh, Why do you need that high power? Uh, so that you don't need that many fibers. Uh, you can split it across multiple channels. And so something like uh, a PSM? Uh, you basically, yeah, I mean, uh, if you look up like CWWDMMSA, right, you talk about like multiple things. Uh, you talk about, say, eight wavelengths, but then if you want to transmit um, uh, 
um, say 32 channels, then you're talking about eight wavelengths, four channels, say, uh, and four of each. So four ports each. So you need high power that can actually account for much DMARs and all these things. And ideally, I don't want to have multiple fibers. It's all like a function of like a, uh, how you overall optimize the system, right? And uh, it just turns out that uh, when you're thinking about the WDM systems of the future, you would want to uh, reduce the fiber count. Um, and you ideally want to match as many signals together. And uh, this probably is, is a good compromise between how many channels you need and how many wavelengths you need and what power you need per wavelength and things like that. Right? Yeah, and no, I, I was just thinking in terms of being a laser guy, uh, uh, the need for high wall pull efficiency and to operate at 70 or 80 C on cool yeah. uh, starts to put that 150 milliwatts in perspective, right? So yeah, uh, it's a pretty daunting task. Really I'm assuming mm -hmm. IR Labs sort of go, went with the uh, uh, using many laser sources. Um, yeah, uh, that's what they have published. They have published the right. array. But fundamentally, even my many laser sources, like there are, I have seen solutions out there um, that can deliver 15% wall plug efficiency at like ATC and uh, deliver up to 100 milliwatts of power. 150, I have not seen, right? I think um, what I can confidently say is you can easily do 100 at like 55C at like a reasonable wall plug efficiency. Everything beyond that is, I mean, that's why we have uh, bright minds like you driving research in this area, right? So, yeah, uh, we'll definitely try to get there for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, I hope uh, that's all the questions. I hope I've not missed any. If I have, I do apologize. Um, and uh, Arnab and Deepashri, I hope uh, you're. Do you have any questions? I have one question. I think oh, yes. it's, it's just a quick Please. question. So this was nice mm -hmm. talk. So like as the individual modulator speeds are getting increased, like from 100 G to 400 G. So how it is difficult for the packaging or still from the packaging point of view, we want to do WDM. Yeah, I think like uh, modulator, um, the, so packaging is not actually a problem. I think, uh, uh, I mean, there are technologies out there uh, that can uh, meet really, as the bandwidth goes up, you need an extremely, extremely short interface between the driver and the modulator. And uh, you need like inter interconnect that are less than like tens of, the, in the order of tens of microns, right? So that can be done with today's packaging technology, uh, electronic packaging technology. But the problem is once we package uh, uh, all this, there is no clean way of like coupling the light in and out because the, there are always like incompatibility between the optical world in terms of coupling and electronic world in terms of doing this packaging. So um, that is the biggest open, like uh, how do we actually uh, do that uh, uh, and in a seamless fashion so that we can also couple the light in and out uh, in a, in a, uh, and also meet these high density requirements, right? So. Um, Unfortunately, that's where there are like a lot of um, un, uh, unmet needs in the in the ecosystem, right? And uh, 400 G per modulator, I think, is um, um, not going to be energy efficient. Uh, we should think about how much the driver. I just talked about. In order to do that, you need like really, really uh, high speed driver. So you're talking about uh, high speed thirties, and uh, I just talked about how. The cost of these uh, uh, technologies is like going through the roof, right? So you want to keep the speed uh, slightly lower, um, amortize the speed as much as possible. So I would go with like 100 G, and then like I have four wavelengths or four fibers, and then multiply. But there are obviously technologies out there that are investigating 200 G, and I'm sure like in isolation, photonics community can come up with 400 G modulator. In isolation, all these things are doable. Um, uh, but I think we really need to think about, does it actually make sense from an overall system standpoint? Uh, is it actually the right uh, uh, trade-off that we are dealing with? <laughs> yeah, I think the photonics engineers and all of us are screaming many wavelengths first before yeah. scaling up in speed, right? So, yeah, I think we all share the same sentiment right now. Uh, so, I think that's the end of all the questions. Uh, Thanks, Vivek, for patiently answering all of them. 
Uh, I'll hand it over to Tashri to give the concluding remarks. Uh, Vijay, did you have anything to say? Yeah, I think uh, over to Dipta Sri. Yeah. Right. Okay. You are uh, mute. you have to unmute Dipta Sri. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vivek, uh, for this nice presentation, and uh, thank you, Professor Sudarshanan, to handle uh, the Q and A session. And my heartful thanks to all the participants. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed it. And uh, the recorded version will be sent to you soon if you understand, want to understand more. Uh, yeah. And I hope to see you all in our next webinar on 6th July. So have a nice evening. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, Vivek. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.